Ted currently oversees all the broadcast operations for the three-time world champion Miami Heat. That's a big job. Uh, you're responsible for the execution of over 80 Heat television broadcasts that take place each season on Sun Sports. And since joining the Miami Heat in 98, uh, you have garnered 20 Emmy Awards and 40 nominations in disciplines ranging from producing, directing, graphic design, short film, and promotions. Awesome, congratulations. You manage and oversee the funding, production, and artistic integrity of Dranoffs, is that Dranoff. correct? Dranoff. Dranoff to piano programs and the advancement of the Dranoff International to Piano Competition. Uh, you're also the creator and producer of the Piano Slam. Piano Slam. Which I had seen videos before, but last night I was just even more curious because of the name. The name just kind of like caught me off guard. And the Dranoff, that, that just sounds really cool. You know, it's like, I want to be a Dranoff. And, uh, okay. you know, but then it's a piano slam. And I'm thinking, how do you slam a piano? You know, so it was just awesome to see. If, it, have you guys seen what they do, what these kids do with, in these piano things? You guys got to go and see the video. Do not miss this because it's amazing. So, um, question obviously, we have to start in the beginning. How did this partnership, because this is like, I'm, I'm seeing the logos back there. I'm thinking piano and slam? basketball. Come on, slam. I'm like, that, right? <laughs> well, actually, um, first of all, I just want to, I don't know who paid uh, the Arts and Business Council to have such a great run on classical music and the future of classical music here. So, um, you know, we've been talking about relationships and we've been talking uh, about collaborations and that connection. And uh, with the Miami Heat, it's been over the top from the very beginning. But of course, I don't, I, we haven't talked about boards yet, board members. And it's just been so terrific to have a board that has a lot of different interests. The Dranoff Competition and the Dranoff International to Piano um, is a classical music organization that really starts, discovers careers for young artists in the two piano field. Um, and that is not uh, always understood by uh, a broader community. But we have a lot of board members who are interested in the future of music and also the future of the Miami community. And so we have this terrific board member, Heather Mann, who had a very close connection to the Miami Heat. And after coming to Piano Slam, saw the kind of connection that uh, the Miami Heat wa might have in the community through Piano Slam. And actually, I'm so glad that Ted is here today because Ted has really been the partner that we've worked with at the Heat all along. So, Ted? Yeah, welcome everyone, uh, and thanks for having us. Uh, I think that you, you, know, you might wonder why would a classical music organization and a, uh, a professional sports organization you know, combine, and um, I think it goes a lot to what um, Carlene said and, and informing your boards and things like that, that the, the broader your fingers are, the broader your reach is, the more people that you, you know, accumulate with various connections, the greater chance you have of reaching people beyond your specific sphere of influence. And so in our case, um, obviously with the Miami Heat, like any sports organization, we have many, you know, philanthropic and community endeavors. And I think the main connection that we have with this organization is uh, we both believe in the future of children. And, you know, the Miami Heat has any number of, you know, platforms, be it our heat academies or our, you know, our basketball camps or our learn to swim programs or any number of, you know, our, our Big Brothers, Big Sisters mentor programs where we connect with children. And so anytime someone comes to us with an initiative where, especially in the community, where you can say that there's a, you know, direct impact on children, you know, that's important to us. I think uh, on, on another layer, obviously our ownership group, you know, Mickey Ayers and Madeline Ayers and Nick Ayers, and um, they're huge supporters of the arts. This building was, you know, built in part because of the uh, Ayers and family, and, and they're huge supporters of the National you know, Young um, uh, Arts Foundation and so many things in this community. Um, and I think it's also for us um, a matter of being good neighbors, you know, because we believe, you know, this event is held in our backyard. Um, and so it's important to kind of find uh, ways to be active participants if you're a professional sports team, uh, not just to kind of talk the talk and, and write some checks, but to be active participants in the betterment of your own community beyond what you do in your sphere of influence of sports. So that's kind of the connection that we've made. And over time, as Carleen says, we've grown that connection. And, and, and um, not just for Piano Slam, we've been able to have 
the Dranoff Foundation involved sometimes at our uh, Heat Family Fest Foundation, you know, uh, you know, events, and uh, so it's 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 a relationship that is built over time, and and that is a former speaker uh, that was Stacy, I think it was, that was up here said, you know, sometimes you have to experience some no's before you get yeah, you know, a yes. And and Carlene and her group have always been, you know, wonderfully persistent and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and certainly, you know, as, uh, as a sports organization, you can imagine whether it's schools or whatever, everyone's always asking you for something and you have to obviously uh, weed out and whittle out and choose from among many things. But this organization really fits in kind of our portfolio of things that we would want to be active in. So maybe we should take a step back and go back to George's first question, like what is Piano Slam and why does Slam make so much sense? Um, the Drownoff is a classical organization, but our artists live all over the world. They don't live in Miami. We don't have a resident company like New World. So when we started taking classical piano concerts by professional young classical pianists into the Miami-Dade public schools, the kids loved it, surprisingly enough. And now we take live concerts into schools each and every year for about 10,000 kids live, dragging two nine-foot Steinway grand pianos around. If you want to move a piano, no, I'm an expert on that these days. Um, but what we found when we tried to reach out to their families was that, um, you know, not a lot of these families, uh, we were going to a lot of low performance schools and not a lot of these families had access or felt that they had access or uh, really had uh, what they thought was a tradition of going to professional um, you know, artistic performance of any kind, dance, theater, uh, symphony orchestra, piano recitals. And so we thought the best thing to do would be to give the students in schools something to do and something to step into the creative process. And I happen to be a great lover of poetry. And it seemed that that alignment of, uh, you know, if I were talking to you, George, or Ted, and you were secretly poets, and I was talking about the beat and the verse and the phrasing, you would think I was talking about poetry. But if I'm talking to a musician about the same thing, they know I'm talking about music. The other thing about music is that it's where we all start in the arts. The question, do we speak first or do we sing first, has just recently been, a been answered, and it's that we sing first. So these kids immediately have a connection to music. So we gave them this, I, this opportunity to write mu poetry about music in their lives. And um, we bring in writers, we bring in hip hop artists, um, but then to the slam part. The slam is a competition. Competitions really is what Dranoff does. And you know, you would go any day to see the great competition at the American Airline Arenas with the heat. So, and then what are those, uh, you know, basketball bit players being seen as doing their seeing as really being a slam, they have a slam dunk. And so that idea of young people being successful through a connection with music just really clicked with the heat. And so from day one, which was about five years ago, um, the Miami Heat players started reading poetry. Yes, Miami Heat players reading poetry and reaching out to the kids. But the real important part was this visibility and presence that the Heat had that spoke to the kids uh, that were in middle school or in high school and not only told them, you know, it's okay to stay in school, it's okay to be smart, but it also, they said, you want to win Piano Slam? You got to compete. You got to visualize, you got to work. And that's what these individual players and the heat set out for these kids. But they always brought it back to the music. So now we've been with 65,000 kids and the impact of Piano Slam, we never s expected it. But you really have to talk to the stature too of your partners. Day one, day one before Piano Slam started, it was a partnership at the Arsht, right here, right next door at the um, night concert hall is where Piano Slam has always been. 
So to step that partnership up and with the Miami Heat was very possible. It was all at the same level. Um, and now it's really the Miami Heat's generosity that makes that happen. We are in the process of taking Piano Slam to Jacksonville, and the first thing the community members said oh, is, oh, the Miami Heat sponsors you? And oh, the Miami Heat is really the only team left in the state that has a real, true, significant, visible community presence. That was kind of sad, but kind of proud at the same time. Yeah, um, and, 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 and uh, I think that uh, for those of you that have never been to this event, obviously it's a free concert, which I think speaks to um, you know, the kind of quality uh, people that are involved in it, you know, Carlene and Gabrielle um, and the Arts Center. But I think, again, when we talk about why would we be involved in something like this, and you see the impact that it has on children. Um, you know, I myself was a young musician, as was my wife a long time ago. But if you go to one of these competitions, you see young people stepping out of their shell who most likely would, if not exposed to these opportunities to speak and learn poetry or even the verses or how it's constructed or anything about music, probably would just have continued on in a path where maybe they wouldn't have done anything. But each now, and the competition begins with many, many children, but the final 16 or 20 that go up on stage, you, you can literally see the onion peeled apart and you can see this wonderful, you know, expression of confidence grow in these kids and that's how you know that this program is working, at the, uh, you know, to see a kid given a chance to perform, have confidence, and ultimately be proud of their performance at ages that range from, what, eight, eight to, you know, yeah, 16 or, yeah, you know. 11 to 17 and, um, you know, it's pretty amazing because it is a competition, but just like that stature. So they write about music, they write poetry about music, and then when we get to the Arsht, it's all classical music in the schools, but when we get to the Arsht, we mix up that classical music with hip hop and hip hop dancing and DJs. And, you know, that kind of hip, the Miami Herald has said what a hip opportunity is for the community to come around together around young talent. But they're also on stage, uh, just uh, here at the Arsh, we worked all day with Terrell Alvin McCraney, one of our MacArthur geniuses. So the level of the writing. And some of these kids, you know, they really do transform. And they do that with, with these examples and role models that are set to them. But it's be Piano Slam has become a big education model for the Miami-Dade Public Schools because one of the things that music does, you have to listen to music. You have to pay attention. And you asked about sports and about um, uh, top-level classical musicians. If you really know what professional sports players do, it's... It's a commitment, just like classical and uh, successful musicians. None of us can imagine that. None of us in this room, unless you are a top level sports player or musician, know that kind of commitment that six, seven hours a day, you come off the stage, you come off the court, and you're right back to where you are because it's what you have before you. And that, in part, is what the Miami Heat has also communicated to these kids. They, they, they have, they don't have a lot of these kids, they see the Heat players, oh, you know, I'm going to be Dwayne Wade. But when uh, the Heat players come into their schools and videos in different ways, and then they're learning to write, they're actually learning to write. And they're learning to say, OK, I know music. OK, I can learn more vocabulary. Um, then they kind of have a path. And that's what a lot of very ambitious kids, um, but kids who really don't see that path, they kind of gain that. And it's the example that the Heat does. And I have to see, say that the Miami Heat is also a financial sponsor of Piano Slam. You know, um, they're great role models and they're super visible, but they also give dollars to that. And they have absolutely opened doors to other foundations, to other people. And, um, you know, Drownoff is a medium-sized arts organization. It's international, but to be uh, really in a partnership with the Miami Heat and the Arsht, and um, that's really been making of Miami. <laughs> so we have to say thanks.
Now, it's, um, it's obvious that your efforts are, on both ends, are very multifaceted in terms of, it's not just, hey, put on a show and it's done. You know, there's a lot more going on here. Just by hearing you speak of uh, the students bringing them up, you know, and these aren't students that are expecting to play, play a piano necessarily because their school even has a piano. Uh, these are underprivileged schools and in, in, in areas that are having a, t a hard time just getting funding, period. Now, how, do, how does that practically work out in your day-to-day -day in terms of, okay, we have marketing to do to reach these schools, to reach these kids. Well, how does the organization now have a practical way of doing that? Well, certainly it's expanded our budget in a way that we hadn't initially planned for. Um, you know, back to the arts side, uh, I talked about hip hop mu music and uh, classical music. Our artists are young. You know, they're in their 20s, they're at the beginning of their career, and we really looked at it as an opportunity to open new doors in classical music. And we see that for the artists who participate in Piano Slam. They're performing at Le Poisson Rouge in New York, they're performing in lots of different venues that they might not have thought of right out of the conservatory. But what the real mission was, as far as audience building and support, was, like Ted said, we feel uh, a real attraction and obligation to support the future of Miami, and that's young people. And all of us in the classical arts, we want a young art audience, we want a young audience. But it just doesn't happen. You know, giving free tickets, Piano Slam is free, but that's completely different. Um, it just doesn't happen that young uh, audiences walk into your doors. And through a lot of marketing and a lot of partnerships and a lot of investment in our budget, we have started to make some progress in getting younger people. But I think the biggest impact is our board. Our board, after seven years of Piano Slam, is on average 20 years younger than it was. And that has made a huge difference in how we operate in the community. And I think, you know, you talk about every event that is here, obviously, there's there's year-round planning. And, and for, for us, I mean, our year starts with Carlene often, you know, shortly before the, the event, we do, you know, letters of support. And then we go from there to once the fall comes and we have access to our players, we literally start in the fall with getting them to, to read the poems and, and, you know, introducing the concept to them. We're editing those videos throughout the course of the year so that they can have them in the schools by February to distribute to the kids, our marketing people you know we have a huge marketing division and we are designing uh, ads for the program we're designing large-scale brochures uh, we did a series of street banners last year um, and and I think that that speaks you know and then there's the event itself but I think that also speaks to the notion of you know uh, partnerships and uh, the value of assets that go beyond you know just writing a check and I know that you know obviously anytime you're in nonprofit or anytime you're in fundraising you know you want to get that check and all that but I think that you have to really think about what are those assets that can really provide the most benefit to our organization and while the heat could certainly write a, a, a sizable check uh, to do that i don't think that's the most valuable thing that uh, that we can provide this particular organization i think as as carlene has said you know several times um you know we give this event street cred you know we give this event credibility with the kids who see athletes that they admire reading poems and as carlene says now it's Hey, if you know if Chris Bosch is reading a poem, it's probably okay for me to write it. I'm not going to get mocked out in school. Um, and then I think any time that you know whether they're seeking other sponsors uh, or just in the community at large, when you can attach you know your name and efforts to something like that, that's that's a contribution that goes far beyond you know monetary you know uh, amounts. So I think it's important too as you're seeking partnerships, et cetera, for all these things to think about um, assets that, that are not necessarily always monet, you know, uh, monetized immediately. So, um, Carlene, you brought uh, a good point up uh, in regards to the board, but not just the board, but a younger board. And I think that um, there's a, a lot of wisdom in that because sometimes we tend to stay in what's comfortable and what's worked before, and we're wondering what's wrong. And it's not necessarily that, you know, the person is no good that's in that place, but there has to be um, uh, just a moving on to be able to relate to that new market that you're trying to attract. Because it, sometimes what we're trying to do is attract the same 
market using, or the new market using old tactics. Oh yeah, you know, this worked in 1960. Well, you know, dude, I think it's time to change. You know, it's, it's you know, the internet is not going away. You know, so it'd kind of be good to kind of like work that in. So if, if those are definitely areas, and especially in the decision-making process, who are people on your board that, not necessarily that they need to go away, they could be mentors to the younger people to bring them up, but you need to infuse that with thoughts that you've never had, with ideas that are like, what? And be able to give that a, a real fuel and an attempt to actually do something different to affect now a brand new audience that you've never chosen. So that certainly is something that is, is of great value in moving these organizations forward. Um, again, I want to kind of like just backtrack really quick because you're, you're going, again, to the schools. You have obviously a very, um, somebody who has a lot of clout for the organization, for Dranoff. Um, so it's easy to kind of like just get in there. And, um, but how do you now, uh, again, I want to go back to the practical side of what this looks like because we can say, oh, well, yeah, we got a plug, but that doesn't necessarily mean, hey, I just put an ad and everybody's going to come. You know, you still got to reach these schools of kids that don't even know who you are. Right. How does that happen? Well, that certainly was an organic process. Um, I grew up in Miami. I went to Coconut Grove Elementary School, then transferred to Morningside. I went to Edison. Um, so I think it's a good question because when you start a project, Piano Slam uh, started um, because we wanted Dranoff performers to play in the Arsht. And the Arsht was looking for a partnership in the community and we were already doing a lot of work in Miami-Dade Public Schools. But we were knocking on doors. I was knocking on Edison, I was knocking on this door and that door. And it wasn't really until the project, through knocking on those doors and being very high quality, reached up to the superintendent of schools, and I certainly can tell you that he was part of that, that we now, we have a whole curriculum guide. They were now in the process of investing resources to have the schools take on all of this, to have formal, we now having formal, you know, music as part of a vocabulary generation. Last year, something bizarre happened, the head of uh, STEM, for uh, Miami-Dade Public School came and pounded on the table and said, why hasn't science and why haven't science and math been included in Piano Slam? Um, uh, we thought we did. Uh, we had no idea we were leaving them out. And now another partnership has uh, emerged with the Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. But those partnerships were very organic. And I have to take a step back to being part of the community, feeling, you know, the thing about Piano Slam it's really not that in 10 or 15 years these kids are going to necessarily all buy season tickets. It's that they and their family are part of the performing arts community today, right now, today. And, um, and so that is a hard thing to do. But one of the things that came out through that knocking on doors is teachers hold the keys. And many teachers don't go to um, ballet or opera or symphony or drown off either. So now through Piano Slam, we give $5 tickets to teachers who are part of Piano Slam to our entire season. But it's been very much a learning process and keeping an eye on the budget, which has been very hard to do because the first year we decided to be in the middle schools around the Arst. Edison, uh, we really engaged the little Haiti community. And it was four middle schools. The second year it was 28. We went from four schools to 28 in one year. And so we had to say, are we in education? Um, organization, we are not. We are performing arts, and we had to start to make partnerships. And the school, we had to get them to put in school, Miami-Dade Public Schools, to put in resources. But we could not have done that without the Miami Heat and the Arsht, because that gave us credibility on the street with the kids. That's what got us in the door in the first place. But that's what gave us the credibility to uh, go to different levels with funding. The Children's Trust has been with us from day one. Um, so this partnership has meant so much on so many different levels. But it's also given us the capability to stay as a performing arts organization. Because we would have never gotten partners that would have taken on some of those pieces if we hadn't had big partners in the community who said, yeah, that we can make that happen. 
happen. And when we come to the Arche, it's directed by Teo Castellanos. You'll see night-funded artists who are doing choreography. It's like the biggest, craziest, hippest Broadway show you ever saw. Just a bunch of kids doing things that are unimaginable to you and to them. Yeah, no, just to follow up, I mean, you talked a while ago about sweat equity, too, and I mean, the two women here, you know, Gabrielle and Carlene, I mean, that's, this doesn't happen if they weren't banging on doors, and, and I think that sometimes the journey that you intend, uh, you know, I, I can't even speak to probably what their vision was seven years ago when Dranoff uh, first introduced the concept of Piano Slam, but I think, too, as an organization, sometimes you have to let the journey take you maybe where you didn't intend it to. And I think that um, in addition to partnering with organizations like ours, I think the the influence and the impact that they've had in schools and the, the relationships that they've developed at the very highest level now with the superintendent uh, has perhaps given their cause even uh, you know greater credibility than they originally intended. You know, this even though they are not necessarily an educational organization, they kind of have become one by default, and they're influencing and impacting young minds and young children, and their greatest legacy of Piano Slam may not necessarily be the concert itself, but it may be the curriculums that they've instituted in these schools where now kids who never got to hear music before or never had an inkling to do poetry are getting that opportunity. So I think sometimes, too, you have to, you may have a certain vision for your organization, but it's important not to necessarily box yourself into that vision and realize that sometimes it can take you to bigger and broader places. That, um, that is certainly um, uh, great news. I mean, uh, it's been seven years. Seven. Um, and I think a, a takeaway in that is just your tenacity to continue in light of, man, I don't know where this is kind of going, but it's going in a way where doors are kind of opening up and it's not necessarily maybe what I started, what I envisioned, but naturally, if you really think about it, that's like natural marketing telling you what to do naturally. You know, and we should not dispel that as like, oh, it was a fluke, and then determine to go another way because this is the way the data shows that I should be going. Um, take those opportunities and open doors that organically happen, and man, if, if an inch opens on that door, run a Mack truck through it. You know, because it's like, that's where the interest, it's a big clue as to where the interest to what it is that you're doing is at. And it might be a surprise to you uh, to go like, oh man, I didn't know that. Well, guess what? That's a way, certainly a big flag as to tell where it is that you should be. Um, so thank you so very much for sharing today your wisdom and your experiences for uh, what we can do. And, and uh, can we give a big thank you to Carlene and Ted for joining us? Thanks again. Carlene, it was a pleasure. Ted, a pleasure, man. Yeah.